Okay, um, our lesson is on page 85, and or it starts on 85, but it's Christ's commitment to <clears throat> us. Even at our worst, Christ was fully committed to love us and bring us to God. And uh, I'm going to the, almost to the bottom of the page, and it says, on top of that, even when our commitment to him wavers, he never stops being committed to us. The greatest display of this is in our salvation. And that is so true, that no matter what, that uh, he's always there for us, and uh, helping us and giving us strength, and helping us to get through things. And uh, so, but then turn the page and it's Romans 5, 6 through 8. It says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I am going to just read a verse at a time. And I found some stuff in uh, the J. Vernon McGee book that I'm going to go read along with these verses. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God has demonstrated his love for you and that he gave his son to die for you. He paid the penalty for your sin and our holy God now can save you, uh, if, you have, if you come his way. There is a mistaken identity today idea, I'm sorry, that you can come to him your way. And we know that from being in church and from being in the Bible, that we can't come to him our way. We have to come his way. This isn't your universe, it's his. You and I can't make the rules. He makes the rules. He says that no man comes to him through without Christ. So, and then verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Do you know of anyone who would die for you? No. No, I don't. Outside of God? Nope. It says, God loved you enough to send his son to die for you. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. God didn't save us by love. He saved us by his grace. And that's so true, too, you know. I mean, uh, you know, he does save us by his grace. And there's no, you know, no matter what other people try to tell you about God, you know, he does save us in that says um, it's good to, it's good I can't it's good news that when we were helpless and hopeless in our sin God didn't sit back with his arms folded expecting us to get our act together before we could enter into a relationship with him he made the first move what was the first move that God made he sent his son mm -hmm. He sent his son, who was born as a baby, who grew up and then uh, went to the cross for our sins. Says, uh, we can keep all of God's commandments. So God came and did it. We can't keep all of God's commandments. So God came and did it for <coughs> us in the person of Jesus. He lived a perfect life and then died in our place on the cross of Calvary paying the penalty for our sin, for us. That brings us to an important question. Why? Why would God leave the glory of heaven to come to this planet just to die for us? Why did he do it? Because well, he loves us. And for the fellowship. That's why he created us. He created us for the fellowship, to, to be able to walk and talk with him. But then when... Adam did his thing and Eve in the garden, that broke all of that. So, it says that brings us an important question. Why? Why would God leave the glory of heaven to come to this planet just to die for us? The scripture is clear because he loves us. 
Arguably, the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3.16. We all know that. For God so loved the world, say it with me, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Love is the key. And, and uh, just like love uh, in our relationships with our family, with our husbands, and stuff like that. Love, love is the key to it, you know. So um, we just need to remember uh, that, uh, you know, that we just need to love each other. God's love for us was more than just a feeling or an emotion. It was a commitment to us. He put into action by willingly dying for us. And the beautiful thing about God's love is that he offered it to us even when we didn't deserve it. God came to us while we were still helpless in our sin. He made the first move and demonstrated his love for us when we couldn't demonstrate it to him. This good news is what separates Christianity from every other belief system that has ever existed. Other beliefs, if you are good, God will love you. If you weren't good, yet God, you weren't good, yet God loves you anyway, even to the point of dying for you. If you get your act together, then God will accept you. You were helpless in your sin, but God helped you and accepts you anyway. Isn't that awesome? That if we would just come to him and, you know, ask for forgiveness for our sin, that he accepts us anyway. And that's what makes that so awesome. How did you come to recognize your need for Christ? No, I'm just looking. <laughs> the Holy Spirit convicts me. Convicted yeah. me. And I think he convicts us all. Uh, people were praying for mm -hmm. us and uh, going to church from even when we were young and always hearing the word, Bible school. Um, and then, uh, you know, at the right time, the Holy Spirit convicts you. <clears throat> and Bible school, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, being in Bible school and hearing the stories and, mm -hmm. and everything, you know, and the songs you know, that they used to teach the kids. It says, My fourth grade teacher. Huh? My fourth grade teacher had a lot to do with leading me to Christ. All right. Good. That's awesome. You know, I'd have to say, Nance, that Aunt B and Uncle Edwin probably were really big in, because they'd pick us up. Our stepmother was Seventh-day Adventist, and so uh, we went to church on Saturday, and then Aunt B and Uncle Edwin wanted to come pick us up and take us back to the church we'd been going to before Dad married her. And so she said, well, if, I guess you can go. She said, but if you can go to church on Sunday, you can go to church with me on Saturday. So we had our church in. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so they came and picked us up and took us over to the little country church that we'd gone to for years. You know, they say... They say little children really don't know what's going on, but my granddaughter was five, and she got up in granddad's lap, and she said, Granddaddy, when you go to heaven, I won't be there. He said, why not? She said, because I'm not saved. And so her parents started talking to her, she and she was five years old attention. when she got saved. Yeah. And she has walked that Christian life her whole life. I wonder. Married a Christian man. She met at Pensacola College and uh, raising her daughter in church. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Romans 5, 9 through 11. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What is the great day of wrath? What is it? Judgment day. Judgment day. Says it is what the Lord Jesus called the great tribulation. Paul tells us we shall be saved from wrath, 
We have been saved by grace. We live by the grace of God. We are saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He died down here, he died down here to save us. He lives up in heaven uh, to keep us saved. I thought that was really neat, the way they put that. He died down here to save us, but he lives in heaven to save us, to keep us saved. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. When we're justified by God, we're officially considered to be individuals who have been made right with him. Atonement takes place when enemies stop fighting each other and, be fri and become friends who go in the same direction together. The good news of the gospel is that while we were still helpless in our sins, Christ came to this planet and died for us. Paul highlighted three things that happened to us because of the death of Christ in our, on our behalf. Justified by Jesus' law, blood, the word justified means having a right standing or a right conduct. It means we are made righteous. To understand the beauty of this, we have to first understand the nature of sin. God is perfectly holy, and because of his absolute holiness, he cannot be in the presence of sin. The bad news is, is that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's Romans 3.23. And not one of us is righteous in and of himself. So when the day of our death comes and we stand in the presence of this perfectly holy God, the only hope we have of entering into his presence is if we are completely and totally righteous. We can accomplish this in one of two ways. We can live perfect lives and never sin, which is an impossibility. I, I can already know that. Uh, we can have someone else's righteousness imputed to us. Imputed is a fancy theological word that means given or substituted when we recognize our inability to live the perfect obedient lives God requires of us. Then we must repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ. Then God declares us to be righteous in his sight and imputes the righteousness of Christ to us through faith. Therefore, when we stand before Almighty God, he sees the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us. How do we receive this righteousness of Christ? By his blood. When Jesus died and shed his blood for us, his blood sacrifice covers us and gives us his righteousness. But to receive the righteousness he offers, we must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and believe that he died for our sins and rose from the dead on the third day. It says, save from God's wrath. God hates sin. God poured out his wrath for our sin on Jesus at the cross of Calvary. And uh, every time I see that or read that, it reminds me of um, that movie that Mel Gibson made. What was the name of that? Um, yeah, what passion, was the, the name? Passion. Uh, the passion. Passion. The Passion. Yeah. And where you saw all these sins coming down on Jesus on the cross. And that, that reminds me so much of that, when God poured his wrath out on Jesus on the cross. And that, and wow, that, that was so awesome. Because of the blood of Christ, we never have to experience God's wrath, but only his love and acceptance. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? That, that we never have to worry about his wrath. And I, if people could just understand that, you know, reconciled to God through Christ Jesus' death, not only are we made righteous in God's sight and saved from his wrath, 
but we also are reconciled, reconciled to God through the death of Christ. At the heart of the gospel, we see God reaching out to us to reconcile us to himself. The greatest joy and contentment we can experience is not in money, friends, or cool experiences, but in a personal relationship with the one who created us. But sin, keep, sin keeps us from experiencing that relationship because our sin broke our relationship with God. Jesus' death reconciles us back into a relationship with him. In other words, Jesus' death restored what was broken and allows us to live in fellowship with God as we were meant to live. Christ's commitment to us didn't just make us better people. He, was brought, he has brought us back to who we were created to be. Hmm. What causes you to rejoice now that you know Christ? I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to heaven. Right. I'm going to I'm going to stand in front of him, you know, and hopefully I am going to hear him say, "Well done, mm -hmm. my good and faithful friend." Oh, I mean, just just to know, just to be able to see him. Doesn't that sound off as, uh, awesome to be able to stand and every in front day we get one day closer. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I said every day we get one day closer. That's right. And to know nothing and <laughs> take us out of his hands. Uh -huh. We're in his hands forever. Oh, yes. we accept him. Nothing can happen. Well, and when we see what's going on oh. in the world today, don't you feel like every day we're one step closer? Uh, when you wake up in the morning, it's like, well, it didn't happen. <laughs> no rapture this morning. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder if... Thank you, Lord, for waking me this morning is so good. Maybe right. better to be the other way. <laughs> Romans 5, 12, 18 through 21. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Who who was the one man that uh, passed sin on to, passed sin on? Jesus. Adam. Adam. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Just because he couldn't say no. <laughs> he not to eat that apple. Yeah, no. So, therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free de free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam's, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. I just put those in there. Uh, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, uh, or Christ's death also means we get to be with God when we die, you know? Yep, and I mean, it's so sad when you know that somebody that's passed away that uh, hasn't gone to church or is not a Christian or something like that, I mean, you know, you you just, you feel bad. You feel bad. But when they don't want to hear anything about it or anything, you know, you know they, I mean, that's such a shame <coughs> because they don't understand what they're giving up, what they won't accept, you know. And you know what? There's preachers out there, and I've heard it for myself. We went to a five-day, I don't know what they called it, different preachers preached, but the pastor of that church, one of the women in the church went down. I went down to pray with her. And she got up and she said, thank you. That's the fifth time I've been saved. And he just kept them, the way he preached, I mean, he, you can lose your salvation. You know, so these people that had been in that church kept getting saved over and over or thought they were getting saved. And I told her, I said, you only need to be saved one time. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, if, if you surrendered your life to Christ, I said, you don't have to 
get saved again, you know, but it, that was terrible. And the next night she brought me this great big old thing. She crocheted for, for praying with her and, you know, Aww. but we left it. I, even our pastor we, from McDonald came down for it and he was just, you know, he was flabbergasted like we were, you know, and other missionaries. It, it, that's what it was, it's a mission conference. Now all these missionaries are hearing this and I prayed nobody takes it back to their church, you know, yeah. and starts that. So, um, well, and you know, there's so many uh, churches out there. Either that. they don't preach, you know, salvation, being saved at yeah, all. Thing. You know, they so just, just they they just like preach feel good messages, you know, yeah. and stuff. And um, yeah. uh, it's like uh, I know my son-in-law. They go to Quest, or they did. I don't know if they still do or not. I, I don't know, but he said that he likes to go there because uh, he talks so you can understand him. And it's like, what does that mean? You know, I mean, is he preaching salvation? Is he preaching uh, sin? You know, and stuff like that. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't get what he meant by that, you know, and stuff, but... Uh, I know that so many of the preachers nowadays, like Joel Olstein and oh, wow. and that, that don't preach, you know, uh, about And the Church sin. of Christ. Mickey's grandmother was a member of Church of Christ. And, you know, when she got Alzheimer's and she kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, oh. you know, and so we don't, you know, it was, we had this doubt. Did she ever get saved, you know? Because by the time we realized how bad she was getting, we, she couldn't understand anything you're trying to tell her, or she wouldn't remember it, you know. So Vicky's always had a doubt whether she actually went to heaven. But really, I want to say, but God knows. Yeah. You this know. really good friend of mine who didn't believe that once you're saved, you're always oh, yeah, saved. There's quite a few like He that. said he... Uh, the way he understood it is that he took God's hand and that if he turned it loose, he was no longer saved. No. And mm. the Bible tells us he takes our hand. That's right. We don't take his. Right. And he, nothing can separate us no. from his yeah. hand. Mm -hmm. He can reach further down than we can reach up. That's right. That's beautiful, though. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. God takes our Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, yeah. you know. I, I I just you know I just wish people could understand that, you know, and stuff. So, yeah. So uh, anyway, okay. Um, do, do, do. Oh, uh, on page ninety one, it says uh, we can't out sin the grace of God. God Christ's love is that great. And his commitment is so immeasurable that even the greatest sinners among us can be saved through the radical grace of God. I love the words of the song, Amazing Grace, and you girls all know them. And then there's the classic hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. I love that song. I love them both, but I love that song. Uh, you know... It says, what can we learn about the impact of sin? Well, you know, I mean, uh, we don't need to learn anything about it. We see it. We see it in our families. We see, you know, what the impact of sin is and that. But we also can see the grace that God extends to each and every one of us, you know, and, and stuff. So, uh, and there at the bottom it says, it's all by grace. It's, it is. It's all by grace. The President of the United States can offer a full pardon to a convict, freeing him from prison. But that doesn't mean that former convict can move into the White House. But in his limitless grace, God pardons and brings us into his kingdom. Kingdom to live forever in his presence. God's grace truly is amazing.